talk is basically going to be on supraconda humerus fractures in children so uh, this is a very important fracture because it's it happens to be one of the more common fractures which requires treatment and uh, uh, it can present to you uh, under circumstances of emergencies as well which would require an immediate management of such cases so uh, when a child walks in or come or is brought in uh, to the emergency department with a fracture around the elbow there are a few things we need to be wary about okay so uh, when we talk about uh, supraconda humeruses in particular uh, these children are going to come to you with the history of fall on an outstretched hand they can also present to you with a history of fall on the point of the elbow itself now uh, this history is important because it gives you an idea whether uh, we are looking at an indirect trauma which is the most common cause leading to an extension type of supracondylar humerus fracture or when you fall or when a child falls on the point of the elbow it is a direct trauma to the point of the elbow and that would lead to a flexion type of supracondylar humerus fractures okay apart from this they come with pain swelling and painful active range of motion around the elbow okay now on physical examination there is of course a gross deformity okay so if when you see it from the side uh, it is going to be like a valley going downwards a hill going downwards uh, so there is a gross deformity there is swelling there can be bruising or ecchymosis or puckering of skin seen around the antecubital fossa okay and when you ask them to move the elbow it's going to be limited and it's going to be extremely painful so before we delve into how to get an x ray or how to get uh, how to treat these particular patients we need to do two particular examinations which would make uh, our life uh, uh, easier as well as more structured so those examinations happen to be the neurovascular examination now uh, if see uh, these these fractures are commonest along the age of around 5 to 8 years of age and it is very difficult to do a neuro examination or a vascular examination for these children okay so even though it's very difficult a neurovascular exam must be done before any reduction maneuver okay and it should also be not just checked for but also documented for okay so checking for both nerve injury as well as vascular injury is important because it could uh, we could also be treat uh, we could also be dealing with an iatrogenic uh, uh, neurovascular injury when it gets either tethered or stuck in the fracture site itself now how do you evaluate for it we check for five different nerves of the upper of the peripheral nerves of the upper limb motor. so those are the anterior interosseous nerve which is the most commonest nerve which is injured in a supracondylar humerus fracture then we have the median nerve now if you think about it median nerve and anterior interosseous nerve are basically the same nerve and they split about 5 to 6 cm above the elbow joint above the region where the uh, uh, sorry below the region where the uh, fracture occurs so even though the fracture occurs when it is a single nerve the anterior interosseous nerve is a deeper nerve okay because it is lying on the anterior portion of the interosseous membrane whereas the median nerve by itself is going to be a more superficial nerve and for that reason the and even though both the nerves are injured at the same time the anterior interosseous nerve presents with a neuropraxia or with a nerve palsy and the median inter, uh, median nerve is often uh, uh, is spared okay however if the if the force of the injury is quite severe then the patient will be having a complete median nerve injury okay so that's the second most commonest nerve injury that you see now these are more common because of the proximal part of the fracture the proximal part of the fracture comes anteriorly and uh, tethers or injures the median nerve when it is passing anterior to the humerus okay if the there is a say a postero uh, medial injury where the uh, the postero medial injury where the proximal part is going more laterally then there is a chance of a radial nerve injury as well okay if there is a posterior lateral dislocation then there is a chance of median nerve injury if it's a posterior medial dislocation there is a chance of radial nerve injury then 
we have the pin injury and lastly we have the ulnar nerve injury now the ulnar nerve injury is present in two particular circumstances the first one is when there is a flexion type of supracondylar humerus injury and the second one happens to be iatrogenic while passing the k wires or the pins through the medial side of the fracture okay so those are the two conditions under which you get a ulnar nerve injury one is natural because of the fracture and the other one is iatrogenic then we check for the vascular examination okay now for vascular examinations we have two peripheral pulses to be checked we need to check whether they are present or absent okay so we have the radial nerve sorry the uh, radial artery and the ulnar artery okay by habit we always check for the radial artery itself however <laughs> it is a good habit to check for both the peripheral uh, arteries okay now after we assess for the pulse we need to check for the perfusion now the pulse will tell us whether the hand is with a pulse or a pulseless hand whereas a perfusion will tell us whether the hand is getting some sort of blood supply through the collaterals or not in case of a vascular injury so then when we assess the perfusion we either get a pink hand which is well perfused the hand will be warm the hand will be pink and the capillary refill time will be less than 2 seconds whereas a poorly perfused hand is what we call a pale pulseless hand it will be cold it will be pale and the capillary refill time will be more than 2 seconds so with this we have these different types of hands we have a hand with a pulse that's the uh, best way that we can uh, best uh, scenario we get where there are pulses are present the second scenario is where the pulses are absent but the hand is pink so this again is a good scenario to have because the collaterals have developed and lastly we have the pale pulseless hand here there is a vascular injury and there is no distal perfusion happening to the limb so this becomes the only emergency situation as far as the vascularity is concerned the other emergency situation where you need to go in and fix them on an emergent basis happens to be the compartment syndrome okay so compartment syndromes are commoner in a pulseless hand both pink and pale so even though a pink pulseless hand is not an a dire emergency we need to keep them under constant observation for the vascularity of the hand the perfusion of the hand and for development of compartment syndrome okay the moment the pain is increasing and is going out of proportion and the child is asking for more analgesia that means the patient is going into a compartment syndrome and you need to go in on an emergency uh, emergent basis and reduce fix and do a fasciotomy for this child okay so this is the examination of a patient okay please uh pay attention to this because this particular 15 second manual is going to make your life extremely easy when it comes to examining a child and finding out which nerves are injured so you try to play a game of rock paper scissors with the child okay by rock you mean the child is able to flex all the fingers that means the median nerve is intact then we do a paper when we do a paper the child's fingers are all extended the wrist is extended and that means that the radial nerve is intact and scissors a working scissors means that the child is able to abduct and adduct the fingers and that means the ulnar nerve is intact okay so this is a rock paper scissor for the three major peripheral nerves we have two other minor peripheral nerves in the form of a anterior interosseous nerve and the posterior interosseous for the anterior interosseous nerve we check for the okay sign in the okay sign we need to check for the flexion of the interphalangeal joint of the thumb as well as the flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint of the index finger so this is okay where the tips of the fingers are touching each other the child might also masquerade this by making an okay this way where the distal interphalangeal joint and the ip joint of the thumb are not flexed so this is a false positive okay sign this is for the anterior interosseous nerve 